Looks like you're live, buddy. We are live. Hello, everyone. We are streaming simultaneously on Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. I think, David, this is the first time we've simultaneously streamed on all of those. I expect because nothing else from you. <laughs> yeah, because you are a very special guest. Um, David, I had so much fun when I met you. Um, and I just want to thank you for coming on this live stream. And um, I, I don't really have like interview questions per se. It's not really my style. I don't think it's really yours. Um, but how's things been since the lockdown? Well, look, I, I, I'm I'm one of the lucky lucky few because I, you know, I'm not unemployed. I still have still meaningfully <laughs> employed and. You know, my work uh, and, and all of our employees are, are, are still engaged. And Rob, I never, I don't like crowds anyway. So I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't go, I don't like to be around a lot of people anyway. So it really hasn't changed my life that much. I mean, I, I have to start my day at 4.30 because I'm in Los Angeles now and so much of my business is in, in London and in Ireland. So I got to start early, but. Other than you know, other than that, other than than uh, starting work in the middle of the night, nothing is different. How many staff do you have across your companies? Well, that goes up and down depending, you know, depending on what we happen to own at the time. We've we've been as high a couple of years ago of twenty thousand. Uh, wow. Now now we're you know uh, closer to a thousand, but it it so it depends on what you have going on. Um, no, I had to furlough. Many no, of those no, we, no it, and that's only because I'm blessed. I happen to be in businesses that look, we, we, we're not. I talked to a guy this morning, all right? He had a new fund. The first three things he bought was a chain of Japanese restaurants, a, um, a event planning company, and um, what was the third? The third one was a. Um, the third one was the worst of all of them. What the hell was it? It was a uh, convention center. So no one, I mean, the last restaurant to open up is going to be cold food. It's going to be sushi, right? That's the last thing you're going to go eat. No one's going to yeah. a convention anymore. No one's planning events anymore. So he's screwed. But the businesses that we're in, technology, bringing broadband to underserved areas, media, those businesses are all doing great. So we're lucky. Mm. And you showed me a picture before we started where you, yeah, show us. You had two beautiful pictures, one of uh, um, the moon and one of the sunset. No, sunrise. Sunrise. Sorry, sunrise. That's what it was. Yeah. So um, you're forced to get up because of the time zone. But do you find yourself productive in those early hours of the morning? Well, yeah, because um, it's it's already lunchtime in London at 4.30 in the morning in Los Angeles. So everybody's roaring to go. So you schedule your first, your first zoom call or your first conference call at 4 30 AM. And then they just go straight through until you are exhausted. But usually from 4 30 to six, I try to have just conference calls. So I can go for a walk, watch the sun come up, watch the, the night come to an end. Like I, I was showing you those, those pictures of the moon and the stars. And then, you know, 45 minutes later, the, I showed you the picture of the sun coming up. So that's that's great. Then I do Zoom calls. And then around midday, I go for another another walk and I do conference calls. Then I do more Zoom calls in the afternoon. And then I go for a walk at the end of the day. I'm out by the beach. So watch the sun set. And then rinse and repeat the next day. <laughs> One thing this lockdown, David, um, and for those of you just tuning in, this is David McCourt. Um, this lockdown, a gift that it's brought me is going on long walks. So um, I used to do my calls at home or avoid calls where I could hide behind WhatsApp, email. And I've probably walked on average two hours a day, maybe more, found some beautiful routes. Who'd have thought Peterborough has beautiful routes, but it does. Haven't been mugged once, so that's a bonus. And uh, I just, I don't know, I, I can't put it into words how impactful it's been on my life. It, obviously, the endorphins, batching all of your calls together. I, I have a therapist, I have a call with her once a week. I do that on my 
walks. I do all my WhatsApp voice memos on my walks. Can batch seven or eight calls in in 90 minutes. And I only discovered that. I'm 41 years old and only discovered that because of lockdown forced me that that was the only way I could get exercise. Um, is that something you've always been doing? I've always been a walker. Look, uh, I'm surprised I haven't been arrested in Los Angeles before because no one out here <laughs> walks. I walk all the time. I walk a minimum of 35 miles a week, minimum. I walk wow. everywhere. And, and I keep track of it. You know, I have a little, you know, I just got this little this little app that tells you, you know, I, I've I've only I've only done one walk so far today, so I've done four point one miles. But um, I walk I walk, but I can't if I do more than thirty five miles, and I walk everywhere. I walk to restaurants. I, I walk everywhere, but I can't really do more than that because my knee. I've had two knee operations, and my knee starts to get cranky. Yeah. But I love to walk. It gives you a good time to think, make phone yeah. calls, do whatever you need to do. Plus, I ride a bike like a maniac. Yeah, because you don't have a car, do you? No. Why no. Does, how, does a billionaire not have a, how does a billionaire not have a car? I, there's two things that you have that I don't have. A car and a therapist. <laughs> okay? I don't have either. I don't want either. And you're the billionaire and I'm not. So there you well, go. I, you're like, I, don't, I used to have a lot of cars, but I, they, uh, there's no, they don't serve much of a purpose anymore. No, well, I mean you live in pretty dense cities, do you? Well, no, I have, I, I, I have a house in the country in Ireland, and I have a house in the beach in Martha's Vineyard, and I take my, I can take a bike if I need to go somewhere or walk in Martha's Vineyard, and I can, look, I rent a car if I, if I, if I need one, or I get a lift from somebody, or I call Uber, or, you know, if I need to go to the airport, someone takes me, but other than that, I walk or a bike or. Is that sorry, David? I could just can't get my head around this. I know we talked about this before, but I have to dig on this. Like, is that a conscious choice? I am not going to own a car, or is it just I don't need a car? No, it was a it was a conscious choice when when um, I, I had a look. There's a there's a jeep at the at the beach house um, that I never drive. That sometimes my the kids come to visit, they sometimes drive it. So there is a Jeep at the beach house in fairness. Uh, I never use it. Um, in, um, in London, I walk or if I need, or, or take public transportation or take an Uber. I had a car in Washington and um, it, it, I hadn't used it in so long. I finally just called my office and said, you know, if you could just clean out the glove box and, and sell it, I hadn't used it in a year. It's a beautiful car. I just don't use it. I just don't use it. I don't have as much stuff as you do. Well, you I've like, got. You like stuff more than me, I think, Rob. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get over that, David. I, I, um, I made myself sell some watches before the lockdown when I thought the, the prices of watches were really high and they could come down because I like watches. And I tried to. I mean, I've got a Lamborghini Aventador set in the garage. I haven't driven it for three months. I tried to start it three weeks ago. I wouldn't start. That's going to have to go back to Lamborghini to get sorted out. That's probably going to cost me three grand. I've got a Ferrari Testarossa parked in, trapped by the Lamborghini that won't start, that I can't drive. So I'm, I, I'm trying to get my head around this. You know, you saw Elon Musk get rid of all, was getting rid of all his stuff. Yeah. This weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Selling, I saw about $100 million worth of houses. Oh, I'm not, never, never going to sell my house. Houses isn't stuff, is it? Investment properties is not stuff in my head. You know, that's that's proper wealth. It's just, yeah, I, I try. I, if I'm really honest with you, David, I think for a few years I made out that it didn't own me and that I owned it. But it can start to own you, the chase. Well, plus you have to you have to worry about all that stuff. That stuff always has a problem. That stuff is always either the roof is leaking or the engine's leaking or <laughs> somewhere yeah. something's always happening with that yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a bit about um, money, David, if that's all right. Um, so uh, someone I've interviewed three times on my podcast who I've become good friends with, 
um, Grant, Grant Cardone. And he has this saying called, which is cash is trash. He thinks cash is trash. He thinks cash is worthless. You shouldn't hold any cash. You know, you should have it in assets. Cash depreciates, cash devalues. Cash isn't worth anything. The government has just continued to print money. And then when the lockdown happened, I asked him again, I said, do you still think cash is trash? Because surely liquidity is really important in times like this. You know, gold and watches and things aren't going to be worth anything when people can't work and, you know, people can't earn and businesses aren't moving. The economy isn't moving. Surely cash is bloody important at that time. So what's your thought on liquidity? How much it should be liquid? Is cash trash? How much should sit in assets, etc.? Okay. Okay. So let's let's um, let's see if Grant will give us just half of the value that his assets have declined over the last ninety days. Because everything in the world has been repriced. I don't know what he owns, but everything has been repriced, and. If ever you want to have cash, now is the time. Just look, you're a, a real, you're a real estate guy. The real estate is a great investment because because it it can handle so much leverage. It's it's an asset. The problem with it is that it needs money to hold real estate. You know, gold and artwork doesn't really take a lot of money to hold it. Real estate, you have to maintain it and pay taxes and fix the roof and all that stuff. But yeah, it 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 can handle an incredible amount of leverage. And the reason it can handle so much leverage is because over time it has done so well, people are comfortable giving you a lot of leverage on it because it's a good asset. So, and as you know, better than anyone, if you buy a portfolio of real estate, then you leverage it, you can buy more real estate. Now you have a bigger portfolio to leverage. You can buy more real estate. You have a bigger portfolio to leverage. So as long as you don't get caught with your first portfolio or your first piece of real estate with a lot of leverage when the market goes down, even if the market goes down, you, you, you're only leveraging that last piece you bought across all of your real estate in theory. And that's how you should do it. So you should be okay. And then you should be cash rich. And then when the market goes down, you buy more. So if you don't get over levered or don't get caught at the wrong time, real estate is great when the market goes up. And it's great when the market goes down, as long as you have cash. But if you follow his theory and you have no cash, what do you do when the market goes down? Like right now, every piece of real estate in the UK has been repriced. Every piece has been repriced. And that's going to get worse. So if you have cash, you can, and you know the real estate business, as you do and a lot of your listeners do, you can expand your portfolio. If you don't have any cash, how do you do that? You can't sell your other assets because they've been devalued. So, look, you know, you, you don't worry when the market goes down because the assets you have have been devalued, but so haven't the other assets. So if you buy, if you, if you own a devalued asset and you buy another devalued asset, you put them two together, you're fine. Mm. One went down and you bought one cheaper. Yeah. What's the, there's no problem. The problem is if you own a devalued asset and you have no cash, now you have to wait a decade for that asset to get back up again. Mm. And I feel bad for people just starting out because, you know, you could be, you know, a friend of mine, I talked to a friend of mine, he has 1,200 coffee shops, 1,200. He was making $15 million a month before now he's making zero. And he still has all those leases and he still, yeah. has, you know, and even, even if he, he comes back, his coffee shops will never have the same volume. It's going to take him three years to retrain everybody to get him up and running. He's going to have to make up six months or a year of, of, of no revenue. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be like he's, his career just that all over again. Mm. And how's he feeling about this lockdown then? I'd say he's feeling pretty shitty. <laughs> yes, that's so pretty much cheap. My stupidest question on any interview. Yeah, 1,200 empty stores that you're paying rent. Yeah. And, I mean, you said just before we went on live, we had a 10-minute chat before we went live, and you, you were asking me about the online events. And you said, that's the future, online. Of course. Because um, I guess you, you're not caught with all that overhead. And then that, that from 15 million a month to zero revenue overnight. 
look, there's huge opportunities, but unfortunately, those opportunities are going to be for people who have already have some experience so they can see those opportunities and already have some cash so they can take advantage of those opportunities. If you have no experience, you have no cash, and someone throws you into the wild in a new environment and you have no context in which to operate, that's tough. How else do you learn, though? Yeah, but it's 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 this could be a, a decade on learning experience. This could be this could be like you know being your first day of uh, what is it called in the UK primary school? What is it called? Grade in the US to call grade school? What is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah. baptism of fire. It's a long baptism though. It might be a decade long. This is not going away. You know these politicians that say this is going to go away quick, and Trump says the economy is going to be booming and up. He's full of shit. That, 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 that's not happening. At best, best case scenario, 20% of the jobs lost never come back. Best case scenario, 20% don't come back. Could wow. be as much as 30% don't come back. Yeah, well, I mean, if you think about industries like travel, absolutely decimated. Travel, decimated. travel hotels. Uh, oh, I know another business that guy owns. You ready for this? That guy that owned all those other businesses this morning, another business he owns that he just bought. It specializes in tours of the UK for continental pensioners, retired people on the continent of Europe. Retired, how many retired people are getting on a crowded bus and going for a tour <laughs> in the UK? Yeah. None. The answer is none. Zero. Not okay. even one. And it's going to be zero for a long, long time. Hi, it's Rob. Quick interruption here to make sure you like this video and you subscribe to the channel. We are upping our content game, bringing you the most disruptive interviewees and guests and content, and not just the people who do the usual circuit. So make sure you like, subscribe, and now let's get back to the interview. How are these guys pivoting? Are you know these friends of yours, big business owners, are they pivoting? How are they handling it? Well, the smart guys and the guys that have capital will, you know, will find out what the right business is to be and they'll buy up the right businesses. They'll be fine. If you have capital and you have brains, you'll be fine. But if you're lacking brains or you're lacking experience or you're lacking capital, it's going to be tough. It's going to be really tough for a long, long time. What, mean, are the what, what are the opportunities do you think that have come out of this? Like if you were buying up some businesses now or getting into some sectors, what would, where would you go? Look, so we, we agree that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, right? So you have to rethink the office space. Like the office space, the, 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 the trend for the last five years has been these hot desks, right? Everybody using the same desk, everybody cheek to jowl. That obviously has to be rethought. Someone has to rethink that. Someone has to rethink the new restaurant experience, the new pub experience. Someone has to rethink remote learning. You and I were talking about that earlier today. You have to rethink uh, online healthcare, online education. People have to reset the business. People have to use this as an excuse to reset the business model. People might have 100 employees. They started with 10 and they have 100. Now they're back to 10 and they're saying to themselves, I can get my revenue back up, but I only need 80 employees or 70 or 60. Now that's not good for the ones you don't bring back, but it's gonna make your, your business more efficient. And anything that's tech enabled, any business that is tech enabled is gonna do, is gonna do great. Online business is gonna do great. Media is gonna do great when, you know, uh, uh, the business I'm in, you know, bringing internet to remote parts of the world, that's going to do great. Restaurants, not too sure about those. Coffee shops, not too sure about those. Old, the old university model, if you're not the top 50 or 100, not too sure about those. Mm. Fact, no, I take that back. I'm very sure about this. They're screwed. If, you, if you're not a top university, you're screwed. People aren't going to spend that money when they can get that education online. Restaurants are screwed. Hospitality is screwed. Conventions are screwed. Airline industry is screwed. Hotels, as we know it, are screwed. Um, you know, event planning screwed. You know, it's it's there's a lot of businesses that are going to take a decade to get back on their feet. Mm. 
not like we're not going to go to restaurants, but, it's, but you know, people thought they could buy a bunch of restaurants and roll out another Pizza Express or something, you know, roll out another chain, go public for a billion dollars. No, well, uh, this has been the big talk, David, between me, my MD and my business partner um, about the, the practical realities of running events again. So I run training events, but that could just as easily be a pub, a coffee shop, a restaurant, a cinema, you know, all the leisure. Um, and even if we can get out in three months, if we have to sit two metres apart, it's, it's still dead. It's, it's only not dead when everyone can go back to normal and everyone can go in again. But if it takes a year or 18 months or two years to get back there, no one's going to have the cash to burn all the overhead in the meantime to sustain the businesses to then be able to start from normal. So a lot of people have been saying to me, Rob, are you going to come out of the events business? I'm not, no, I'm not going to come out of the events business. I'm going to have a hybrid model where I'll continue to run online events and watch what happens in the leisure industry. Because by the same token, I do feel that when people can get back out again, they want to, they'll want to. I know you said you're not really one for crowds. Um, I got a bit introverted, but now I've been seven, eight weeks pretty much on my own. I want to go and meet people again. I'd want to go to a course. I'd want to hug random people, touch and kiss random people because I miss people. So, yeah, I, I perceive in my business anyway, it's a bit of a hybrid whereby events are maybe the special element, the less frequent element. Maybe the whole business doesn't rely on that. The online might be where it's scalable, it's global. Um, it's also interesting, David, because I don't know, I'm not as, maybe because you're at a bigger league than me. You know, you, you're a billionaire, you talk to people who run billion dollar businesses, you know, thousands of chains. Um, yes, I had to cancel 300 events, but I replaced that income pretty quick with online events. And I, I don't think my events business is screwed at all. I think... If it takes six, three months, six months, a year for me to run events, I can just wait, run online. Events. You're 100% you're, you're, you're right. I, I should have said I should have said the traditional events business. And what I was thinking about events was not – I'm thinking of your business as online education, uh, as education, not yes. events. Yes. I'm thinking of your – you're adding you're, – you're delivering a service that's intended for people to buy it, and they're going to better their life, and they're going to make more money after they take your course than they did before they took it. So that's the idea. So if someone's going to give you $100, they intend to be able to then go make more than $100. Otherwise, they wouldn't They wouldn't do it. That's different. When I was talking about the events, I'm talking about um, you're going to Las Vegas and 200,000 people are coming in for the Consumer Electronics Show or 2 million people or 3 million people would ever come or the cable, National Cable TV Association, 2 million people going to New Orleans you know, pig farmers going to wherever they go, you know, the cow milking association goes wherever they go, you know, real estate association that goes to wherever they go. That's what I was talking about. I wasn't talking about your business model is needed more now than ever because people need people that don't have the experience you have need to learn from you of how they navigate through a post COVID world. So I think of your business as the educational business, not the uh, events business. And mm. you can move your business to a hybrid online. So I don't think your yeah. business is, I don't think your business is screwed, but you're not really what I would think of as the events. How about concerts? How long is it going to, I mean, concerts will come back, but they're not coming back this year. No, no. He's not going on tour this year. No. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I know quite a lot of um, people in the entertainment business, the celebrities in the U in the UK, and all bets are off. There's nothing for them to do. Nothing. I mean, even things like entertainment, like there's going to be um, a, a, a huge lack of TV come through because they haven't been able to create new TV programs. So, just going to be rehashing re re repeats. Yeah, I don't. I, maybe the linear channels, but the streaming guys, if they have a backlog. They have a backlog, right. and those guys will get up and running. They'll be working, you know. They'll be working twenty four hours a day to, yeah, produce a lot. And you can still you can still edit the stuff 
Post-production is still taking place today. I'm out in LA. Po all my post-production friends are still working and all my pre-production friends are still working. So they just have to jam through the production piece when this right. is all. Surely, though, that's a great opportunity content-wise. We were talking before um, we went live. In fact, I think your words, David, were you put a lot of fucking content out there. Um, surely that's a great opportunity now if mainstream content is going to slow down, someone who wants to build their brand, someone who wants to, um, you know, I don't know, be a commentator for their niche or their industry or um, leverage social media and online for building their education business, their influencer business, whatever. Surely this, that's a great opportunity. Yeah, maybe, but there's a, a lot, there's a, there's a big need. There's also a lot of people doing it. You were early, you know, there's, there's a handful of people in every country that were early that are doing great, but someone that wants to compete with you now, if they're going to get into your market, your segment now, it's going to be much harder than it was for you because you were, you were early. You know what I mean? But like, is that, it doesn't ever, doesn't everyone have to start somewhere though? Yeah, but, but um, everyone has to start somewhere, but there are certain people that are, that are early and then they have first mover advantage and then they have built an audience. It becomes a little easier. So now people have to steal away your audience. I don't know. I, I, I think this, there's something to be said for a first mover advantage. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't as early as Joe Rogan. I'm no Joe Rogan, so. Joe Rogan, uh, well, he's the gold standard, right? Yeah. I mean, he's doing really, really well. But 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 he was mm. he was early, but he also had a he had he had deep sector knowledge. Um because he, he was in he was a comedian, right? Early. So he had he yeah. had a following already. Uh and wasn't he an, an announcer for uh wasn't he UFC. a wrestling announcer as well? Yeah, yeah. UFC already had a good following. So um, he had he had a pre-podcast two two groups of followers pre-podcast yeah. and he brought those with him yeah so after he brought those with you know he brought those with him so he started with a pretty good audience yeah that, that really fascinates me saying that david i have to be honest and say i just feel like saying if someone wants to get out there and put their name out there and do their thing they should fucking just do their thing and they don't they shouldn't want to be a, a, a me or you or Joe Rogan, they should just want to be them and find their unique space and take advantage of the fact that there's so many more people online now. Cause surely the one universal fact has got to be we're all online a lot more, whether it's zoom calls or on social media, because we can't do all that other stuff. Is that not an opportunity? Yeah. I, I'm just saying there's a lot of competition. Mm. A lot but of, lot is of, there no you know, Sorry. I run people all the time that say, oh, Netflix needs a lot of content. Uh, I, I'm going to go be a producer. I say, oh, well, good luck. Let me know how you make out. Because Netflix, you know, th there's every time you, you, you look at Netflix, there's new stuff coming. They, they go through it very, very quickly. Not a lot of stuff gets called back. They go through it very, mm. very quickly. I mean, mm. there's a lot of content. There's a lot of people producing it, too. Yeah. Is there not always room for the best? Sure. But it's even easier if you can get into a business segment where you don't have to be the best and you can still make money. That's a little easier. <laughs> Surely in your space, that sounds like a competitive business, isn't it? Yeah, but now, look, at some point over over a 30-year career, you, 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 you build some ex expertise. So then you have an advantage because you have some sector knowledge and you have a track record and, and you know the right people. And, you know, so it becomes a little easier. My business is brutally competitive, brutally mm. competitive, but I know but the didn't. business and I know yeah. it better than most people do. Right. Hmm. Don't you want, do you, an, um, you want an easy business? Like one that you don't have to be the best at that you can still make money. What, what are those then? I don't know. Let me know. I was hoping <laughs> you were going to tell me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I love, I, I do love um, education sector because I think if you've got some knowledge and experience or some passion and you've got an internet connection, I think you've always got an audience. How do you advertise uh, for your business? All online? 
Yeah, pretty much. So Facebook ads, Google ads, Amazon ads, um, YouTube ads, social media, you know, email database, partnerships and joint ventures and um, you know, other influencers. They would promote us some text message marketing, some letters, actually le letters is probably a good thing to do now. You know, back in the day, everyone used to do the direct mail and of course then email took over who gets a letter now. I think that's a good opportunity. Um, so yeah, mostly online. We don't really do much print at all. Don't really do much to TV radio at all. And we have tested that and spent a whole lot. I mean, for me, pay-per-click was a, a revolution. Because before pay-per-click, i.e. you can pay five cents a click and you can test and measure and split test and um, have whatever budget you want. Before that, you had to spend a thousand or five thousand or ten thousand or twenty thousand or fifty thousand or five million up front on an ad with no guarantee. So um, pay-per-click surely got to be one of the best inventions of the last 20 years. Online advertising is fabulous. For for every, for both parties, mm. for both parties, targeted, relatively inexpensive, tar very targeted, but it's pretty much a monopoly now, anyway. Mm. Social media, do you um, is that something you embrace, you like, you use, you play with? Play with, I guess. Play with, I guess. I don't know if I. Um, I don't know if I like it or not, but I play with it because you, you have no choice but to play with it because, you know, it's a big part of so many people's lives and, and you have to be, you know, you have to be in, in the game, learning, testing, trying it out. I haven't, mm. you know, I don't put out content like you do. I mean, you're putting out content every day, twice a day, three times a day, four times a day, whatever you're doing. Mm. No, I'm not, I'm not doing that, but <laughs> playing around with it. And I answer people if they buy my book and they, and they DM me or they hit me up on LinkedIn. I, I try to respond to everybody. If they, you know, if they have a question about the book or, you know, I try to. Yeah. Actually, I want to talk about that because there's some, something serendipitous about your book, I think. Um, because, in a way, I think it's made you a bit of a sage, a bit of a um, predictor to a certain degree of the future. Because last time we talked, um, we, we met in London and, you know, 70, 80 of my best customers came to watch you speak. And we went and had dinner at Burger and Lobster. And um, you said, look, we need to really, really, really rethink, really rethink some of these structures, whether it was politics or business or whatever. And bang, look at the lockdown. If you're surely you've got to sell more books now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it was, it was, um, look, whether it was this virus or something else, we still had a systemic problem. Everything, it, it, you know, politics and capitalism is broken. The political system is broken. Healthcare system is broken. The educational system is broken. How much other shit can you break and still expect there not to be a big problem? I mean, why, like, why is capitalism broken? That one fascinates me. Why, is, why do you think that's broken? Well, because the capitalism I grew up in, and I'm a, I benefited from this system. I'm a beneficiary of this system. You contributed to the societies and the communities you do business in, and you made a profit. With the advent of private equity, where they have to recycle the money every three to five years, they're really trying to extract as much value as they can over the shortest period of time and not contributing to the community. And that's caused a, uh, a bigger income gap, and that's caused a bigger wealth gap, and that's caused people to be pissed off, and that's caused there to be less jobs. And it's caused there to put less money into companies for R&D and long-term thinking and long-term training. The best part of being a capitalist is, is deploying human and financial capital and, and watching people grow and training people and watching people 
take on more responsibility and care for their families and and grow their own net worth. That's the, that's the funnest part of it is watching people grow. If you're gonna come in and just fire people to increase your profit and not put money into long-term plans because you know you're gonna sell out in three to four years, that's no fun. I mean, mm. it's fun, I guess it's fun if you're counting money, but it's no fun if you're trying to grow a business or, or change the way people perceive you or the world or your employees or the community you're doing business in. So people are pissed off about that and that's going to change and it's not going to change for the good for business in a, at a time when we need capitalism and policymakers to work hand in glove the way they used to. And the policymakers, they're just as fucked up because they only care. Are you allowed to say that on social media? Yeah, you already did. So it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> oh, it's like, yeah. So yeah. they they are they're messed up because they, they only care about getting reelected. They don't care about serving their communities either. They're solely focused on getting reelected. So you got one group that's that's you know, someone a lot smarter than me said the only problem with democracy is it encourages short-term thinking, but that's gotten from short-term thinking like this to short-term thinking like this. So you got one group that only cares about getting reelected and one group that only cares about making money. In, in the third group, which is society, which is people, they're getting left out. So there's going to be a big rethinking. It's not going to be pretty for a lot of people. What's the solution then? The solution is capitalism. Business should, should fix their problem themselves because the solution that someone else is going to give them is going to be bad. We got to get rid of, uh, we, in the States, we need election reform. We need to get rid of lobbyists. We need election reform. The amount of money they spend to get reelected is ridiculous. You need to have term limits because, look, politicians lie to get reelected. If you had term limits, you didn't have to get reelected, there'd be no reason to lie. I mean, you might as well tell the truth. If, you, if it's not going to affect you getting reelected because you're not going to be running for office again, you just as easy to tell the truth. So... You need term limits, you need election reform, you need to get rid of the lobbyists, and that will help get the people will be attracted to politics for the reason that they really actually want to make a change over a short period of time and then get out. And yeah, there will be some people that were great that you wish could stay, but they can't. And that's fine. There'll be a new, greater, younger woman or man coming along. And capitalists got to start contributing to the communities they do business in. Otherwise, it's going to be a a, a revolution against both. You already see the revolution against the politicians, but that's what gives you people like Boris and it just gives you people like Trump is a knee jerk reaction where people want something dramatically different. Yeah. Surely as an entrepreneur, as a business owner ourselves, we can make productive steps by continuing to employ, to train and develop our staff, to invest in our own innovation, solve meaningful problems, do what great entrepreneurs do. And try to work, you know, try to work with policymakers to deliver solutions. But young, you look, the third group here, which is society. Last time there was a big rethink of how capitalism worked was the New Deal and FDR in the States. But that was because the government the policymakers were making a deal with society that was getting screwed. So right now it's policymakers and capitalists have to make a deal or society, the bottom, and this is what I talk about in my book, it's going to be a revolution from the bottom up because the top down hasn't worked very well. I don't know. Your listeners have just got to read the book and let me know what they think. <laughs> the book's called Total Rethink. Uh as soon as it came out, David, I listened to it on audio and I loved it. Um, so I, I, I'm a fan myself. Um, we've had a, quite a lot of questions come in and I don't want to just save them to the end because I want to get the audience involved. Or, or I might throw, throw in a few at you. you. Throw them all at me. Okay. So this one's from John Paul Riley. And he's asked, what was harder, earning 1 million, 10 million or 100 million? Oh, Earn, earning the first dollar is always the hardest. It gets, it, it gets, it's like everything else in life. It gets easier as you move along, for sure. For sure, the beginning, which is why we need to change, 
you know, you need to change the, the whole system needs to be changed, the educational system, the training system, how we train people, how we give people skills, all has to be changed way harder at the beginning. Okay. And you're saying if there's a system change, it might not be as hard at the beginning. It doesn't have to be as hard. Look, look, the way we train people and the skills we give, the way we train people in the skills and education is a relatively flat slope. The new jobs we need is at the steepest slope it's ever been. Like how stupid is that? You want your education slope to be ahead of the jobs you need. Mm. It's, it's like almost flat. And, and the jobs we need are like this. And the old jobs are declining like this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's short term. You know, it's, it's, it's the educational system and the training and the skills training need to be totally rethought. And you're in a position to do that. You can do that in your own business, in your sector. Okay. Thank you. Uh, right. So let's go to this one. Um, Jeffrey Allen, this is from. He's, this has been quite presumptuous, unless he's read this in your book, David. But he said, David, you have lived through five downturns. <laughs> uh, do you believe COVID-19 is the mother of them all? Yeah, for sure. Not even. Look, when have we ever had a downturn where for every 100 jobs we've lost, 30 of them are never coming back? And everything we know about the way we do business has changed. It's, it's the mother of them all, for sure. Now, the mother of every downturn is also the father of opportunity. I mean, there'll be lots of opportunities. But a lot of smart people, you know, aren't going to have the capital to be able to seize on those opportunities, which is unfortunate. And don't be fooled by the stock market thinking that that's a reflection of how well the economy is doing. Unrelated. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So this is from Andy Lampard. Um, regarding the growing mental health crisis, should entrepreneurs who act like revolutionaries address the current health crisis, the current mental health crisis, um, the looming huge wealth crisis of large scale, long term unemployment? So I guess if I could summarize that question, um, should entrepreneurs who act like revolutionaries address the growing mental health and wealth crisis? hundred percent. It Look, and I talk about this in my book, the healthcare system needs a whole total rethink, but the pharmaceutical industry is almost criminal. If you look in, there's a, a British guy named Ian Robinson. I just read uh, two of his books. One's called, I think, the stress test, and the I don't know. They're both about. He's a British guy now. He lives in Dublin, actually, or he says in the book anyway. He, he talks about how the hardware and the software in your brain interact, right? So, like for a hundred years, we were just like zapping people, right, giving them lobotomies if their brain wasn't working right. And so we figured that that didn't work out too good, right? Electric shock therapy and all that stuff. So once we stopped doing that, we just started giving them drugs. And that hasn't worked out very well either. But the problem with, with that solution is a lot of drug makers are making money with that solution. So they're encouraging the use of it. I mean, how many people made those machines that you put in the side of your head and give you a little shock therapy? You know, that, that wasn't that many. The drug companies are selling medicine by the billions of tablets. And so they're encouraging the the use of medicine as the only solution for mental health mental health is, is, is complicated and it needs a complicated rethink but you can start by making sure people have jobs i mean to, look just to go back to election reform for a minute and, and take this as an example so just take west virginia as a small part of america that was supposed to be Hillary Clinton was supposed to win it by landslide and Trump won. Why? Because Hillary Clinton walked into West Virginia and said, we have to close all these coal mines. And Clint, um, Trump came in and said, we're going to keep them open. Now, neither of them had a plan. They were both just making it up. So neither of them had a plan, but they both were had their sound bites. 
So the 55 year old guy that's picking coal for a living, he's like, you can't just come in here and take my job away. The right answer is we're going to come in and create new jobs first, then we'll close the coal mines. Because you can't take a 50-year-old man and say, I'm going to retrain you. What the hell are you going to retrain a 50-year-old man who's been picking coal for 25 years? So unemployment and not training people for the new economy creates all sorts of mental health problems. Unemployment and uh, no sense of dignity, taking a man's dignity away is a huge driver of mental health problems. Huge driver. Probably the biggest driver. So that... Of course, entrepreneurs should figure that out. You can't, who are you going to count on to figure that out? Politicians? Mm -hmm. Never happen. Never happen. Okay, thank you, David. We have an anonymous one here, um, which is, are there any downsides to being rich? Yeah, of course. Of course. First of all, you're the one that says I'm rich, not me. But is there, um, of course. Of course. Look, um, the, the how much money someone has, it, it's a little bit of a, um, I, I'm not a big stuff guy, right? I got one watch. You got a whole collection. I don't even know where mine is, but I got one. Um, and I, like, I, I'm, I don't like crowds and I don't like stuff. So I don't have utility for a lot of money. So, um, but there's a huge downside. It's one more thing that you have to worry about. One more thing that you have to be careful with. What you want to do is find something you love to do and hopefully do it with people you love. And then you've won. You, you do what you love with people you love and then it doesn't make a difference. It makes no difference. I mean that. You know me well enough to know how, how sincere I am about that. Mm. You've been peeling away at the scab every time we talk because you're curious about whether it's, you know, how, how re real it is. And um, I remember that time we were talking, I went to the loo and you said, yeah, easy for him to say, easy for him to say he has a lot of money or something like that. And I came out and I said, I can hear you in the loo. I can hear you. <laughs> I forget where that was. In London somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. The mic was still on. Yeah. 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 Hey, look, that wasn't my question. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by money, David. I wrote a book called Money, which has done well here in the UK. Um, I'm fascinated by it. I think, you know, in a lot, a lot of ways, obviously, we're driven by capitalism. Money is our universal agreed form of exchange. I'm fascinated how some people have a love affair with it. Some people have a terrible love-hate relationship with it. Some people are owned by it. Some people always chasing it. Some people have got plenty and don't really care. Some people have made billions and are giving it away. Some people will screw people over not much of it. I just think it's an absolutely fascinating subject. And I don't know, I don't think it's talked about enough in the UK in, in an honest way. Um, I think we, that we have a lot of reservations and hang-ups and issues and social um, stigmas towards money here in the UK, David. Um, and, you know, I've asked you a few times about it because there's no denying you're a successful man who's made a lot of money. There's no denying that. And your your humility doesn't change that. Um, and I'm always, I've, you know, in the interactions we've had together, I've, I've felt like every time I've gone there, you just kind of, I don't have a car or money. Don't, I don't need money. And you've always just sort of elegantly moved it to the side, um, which is fine because. You know, like uh, what I love about conversations like this is they go where they go. Um, I wrote a book called Money a few years ago because I wanted to change the dialogue around money for people to stop thinking it's bad, it's evil, it's stigmatized. You know, money can be a force for good. It doesn't have to be a force for power and greed. You could do great things with money. There are many famous billionaires. I think Bill Bartman is one of them. There's loads of famous billionaires who are just giving it all away. Of and course great things with it and i guess that's a dialogue i'd like to try and get going and um yeah, yeah i'm not saying it's evil i never said i never said it was evil i just said i don't have a utility for a lot but it's not evil mm. if 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 a, you know if it wasn't for money and the ability for for people to feel a sense of of gamification of their business right 
it's sort of, it keeps, it's a way of keeping score. So it makes people get up a little earlier and make people work a little harder. So it's good. Yeah. Well, it's nothing wrong with that. I mean, people want to look, if I told you I had a, um, a business that was in the exact same business as yours, and I had told you that I was doing 30% more revenue than you, you'd wake up tomorrow and you'd say, okay, I got to do 35% more revenue next year. That's how, yeah. that's how you take that conversation. You would internalize that and say, well, if he's doing 30% more than me, then my goal is to do 35% more. And then I'm yeah. going to call him up and tell him I'm doing 5% more than him. I mean, uh -huh. that's, that's just the way, you, you know, that's the way people are competitive. And, mm. and that's the way... So it's a good way to keep score. So I'm not saying it's evil at all. It's the, it's what you need to solve society's problems. It's pretty hard to fix healthcare without money. It's pretty hard to fix education without money. It's pretty hard to fix the social safety net without money. Yeah. That point about game, gamification, I think, is, is great, David. And, you know, many successful people say, don't they, that money is the way to keep the score of the game. Um, I mean, one of the economic definitions of money is a unit of account and i think if you take emotion out of money like greed and power and um, love and you know whatever else out and you just understand the the fundamental economic principles of money then i think you have a better relationship with it um it's you know it sounds like you have a very good healthy relationship with money um do a lot of like a lot of people in the UK, they're like all millionaires are or all billionaires are. And they and, and it, they fundamentally say greed, evade taxes, um, you know, play the play the system unfairly. You know, a lot of very wealthy people. What generalizations can you make about wealthy people and any are there any reverse stereotypes? No, I don't I don't think that all wealthy people are greedy. I, I would say that that um, in general, um, I think that um, in general, these are generalizations, you know, wealthy people probably tend to be a little bit more selfish. Uh, we'll put it this way. If, um, if you and I, and I'm, look, I'm making a generalization, but if, if you and I are, are on the side of the road with a flat tire, um, chances are it's not going to be a gazillionaire that pulls over to help us change the tire. It's going to be, you know, some blue collar worker or some, you know, regular guy, that guy or girl that stops by and says, hey, Rob, you need some help. And I'm saying someone that doesn't know you and says, hey, you need a little help and, and help. Chances are that's who's going to help you. I don't, I don't know. I mean, that would be my guess. But, but what if you or I could pay for someone to do it and create economy? Oh, I'm not saying it's evil. I'm not saying it's evil. I'm just saying that if they, it, it, I'm not saying it's evil. I'm just saying if they contributed more in general, in general, people would have less, would look at them, them being that group, mm. look at them better if they contributed more. Mm. Okay. Well, if a lot is given to you, a lot, a lot's expected of you. Yeah. Yes. The responsibility of it. There's, um, there's something that's coming up a lot in the thread, David, and I must admit I'm a bit naive to this. I'm, I, it's not even really a question. But there's a lot of comments on the live about Olympic de Marseille that um, your brother owns. Is, could you? Is that true? I, 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 I my brother's business is my brother's business. Uh, he he owns a sports team, and a lot of people ask questions about it. But I I I I never ask him about his business. He never asked me about mine. So is that like you saying next question, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> next question, Rob. Is is there some is there some old wounds there? No, no, no. There's just some rumors in the paper that it was for sale, that, and that's why I'm sure people are getting that. Right. There's just some. There's some rumors that it was. For sale, so uh, you know, I don't, I, and I don't even know how he responded. He either said it was or wasn't. I don't know. Hmm. Okay, well, thanks for clearing that up. Uh, right, do you have any charities that you support, or any sort of you know um, causes that you you stand for? Yeah, I just uh, this, sorry, sorry, David. This is from Marcus Chambers. Yeah, um, 
Are all your listeners male, huh? No. Okay, just no, check. Some are anonymous. Maybe the, all the female. Yeah, come on, ladies, get some questions. <laughs> Make sure that you're like you haven't alienated all the females in the UK. I probably have. <laughs> so, um, a couple. One, a group of of friends of mine, you know, down on the beach. We all each contributed a sum of money to set up a charity, um, and then we hired us a school teacher to run it. And we all put a bunch of money in it and hired someone full time um, so that people would stop inviting us to cocktail parties in the summer when they really weren't inviting us to a cocktail party. They just wanted money, right? Because America is a very philanthropic country and, and it's full of invitations to cocktail parties for one charity or another. So we set that up and, and that's doing well. Another recent foundation we just we just set up for rural Ireland, which is to figure out how to end the rural urban divide, which is a big issue. I have 3 million people a week move to urban environments around the world. So that means we're creating another London every three weeks or another Hong Kong or another New York every three weeks. So in the world, so that in the, in the rural areas are being left behind. So we have to think about that's not good for the economy. It's not good for housing prices. It's not good for um, uh, the carbon footprint. It's not good for congestion, pollution. So we're leaving rural Ireland, rural England, rural America. We're leaving those areas decimated. So that's a big issue of mine. And we, we put a lot of money into, and we set up a foundation to try to figure out how to stimulate jobs in rural parts of the country. Uh, of, of the world, uh, and that's a big issue of mine. So yeah, there's a lot of things I'm I'm interested in from a philanthropic standpoint. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to talk again about your book, Total Rethink. But before we do, any books you've read recently that have uh, impacted you in a good way? Yeah, they were all from from um, English authors too. You guys are you guys are doing well in my library. There's, <laughs> a, there's two by Ian Robinson, um, The Stress Test, and I forget what the other one's called, both um, around, they're both about how the hardware and the software of the brain works. There's one called The Second Curve by another British guy. Um, that's, that's, that book is interesting. It's about how we always make changes in our life after we've peaked. Everybody waits after they peak and that's, they don't have as much capital, as much energy, or as, as much natural resource, or as good connections. But they did it when they're on the upward, when their connections are at the strongest. And this is institutions as well as people. When their connections and their soft power was at the strongest, their capital and their balance sheets at the strongest, then they could find the next wave. But they always wait until after they peak. But, you know, we see that in business all the time. You know, you saw that. The phone companies got into the internet business after the cable modem was kicking their ass. People, you know, uh, the networks got into the streaming business after Netflix was kicking their ass. Um, you see that over and over again. People, so those are three books. The, 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 the two on the, how the brain works and the one on the second curve. Those are the three that I just recently read. Okay. Is there a seminal one? I also read a book. Um, the Atlas of the um, Irish Revolution uh, was published by the University of Cork and uh, won the Atlas of the Irish Famine, again, by um, uh, John Crowley uh, at University uh, College Cork. Okay. Is there a seminal one? Is there like one that you think, if there's one book every entrepreneur, start or scale up, should read? That is shameless, Dave. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? <laughs> Total rethink. Um, why did you write your book? What was what what forces came to play for you to write a book about Total Rethink? Because no one else was saying it, that we we can't go on for a hundred years, all of our problems were coming out coming at us with, with, with in an incremental way. And we were using incremental solutions to solve incremental problems. 
And I was saying, look, these problems are coming at us like a freight train and we can't use incremental solutions for problems that are coming at us like a freight train around healthcare, around mental health, around education, around jobs. We just can't, we can't use incremental solutions to problems that are coming at us in a revolutionary way. We need revolutionary thinking. And this is true not only in business, but it's true in, in how you lead your life. In, 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 and I just thought that people needed some encouragement to think more revolutionary about their lives and their businesses because of the speed and size of the problems we're dealing with. Um, why don't people think more like that? Um, it's hard and it's scary. Yeah. It's Risky. much easier, it's much easier to make a baby step. Yeah. It's scary to blow. Look, Rob, you know, you have some experience behind you, but if you didn't have any experience behind you and you had one class that you were teaching yourself and every day you will walk into the classroom and you're teaching one class because that's how you started with one class that you were teaching. And all of a sudden that model is gone. Or that's an easier example because then you have no choice. If you're teaching one class and you're by yourself and everything changes, you know, it, it, it's hard for you to think about how to change. I guess I should preface this by saying, no, nothing is changing. You have to change it yourself. If, if there's a pandemic, it's a little easier because you have no choice. But if you're, if you're teaching one class by yourself, how do you wake up one day? How do you have the energy and the time and the resource to wake up and say, I'm going to totally rethink my model and start all over again? It's hard. It's scary. You have a model that's working. It's paying the bills. It's, it's happy. It's working. Now you're at a stage where you have enough scale that you can rethink your model. But you didn't always. Well, you know what? That's one of the things I'm really grateful for about the lockdown. Um, because I agree with you. I think that um, the pandemic and the lockdown actually has forced people's hands in that it's forced change it's forced a rethink it's forced a disruption it's forced a pivot for many businesses it's just no choice and when there is no choice sometimes it's easier because when there's too many choices um so so you know i wanted to scale up events globally for years and i just didn't because i didn't need to and whilst i now know i didn't i still don't need to for eight weeks, there was the clear and present threat that I might have to. And because I have to, we, we got eight we got eight courses written in eight weeks where we it would take us three years to write eight courses. So we knew this day was coming. So it's easy for you. But why weren't the policymakers? Because they knew that the educational system was broken. And you're just a microcosm of the whole educational system, which is which is broken. So why weren't they thinking about retraining people like in getting people ready for the new jobs that are coming? Why are we still training people the old way? I'm talking about I'm not talking about your courses. I'm talking yeah. about the educational system in general. The reason your business exists is because the educational system in general is not serving that market. Mm. They're not, you're taking people and saying, come here, take my course. I'm going to help you better your life and help you make money so you can support your family better. You can support yourself better. You can hire people. You can train people. You can grow your business. Well, where was the, where, where, where was the educational institutions? Why weren't they doing that a long time, way before you came up with the idea? Well, I think you summed it up. I think it's um, short-term thinking, isn't it? Surely, surely if someone was a, a various helms of control with a 20 year plan and the backing to execute that plan, which of course the political system doesn't allow, surely then you can make a, a real difference. They're too busy trying to get reelected to worry about long-term solutions. Mm. And that's where you think the system's fund fundamentally broken. For sure. Yeah. But, but at least I'm not blaming just policymakers. I'm saying it's, sure. it's Policymakers, half businesses. Yeah. And the individual is getting screwed. I mean, if you run your own enterprise, I mean, Mark and I, my business partner, um, we we talk every year about making our business robust for another 50 years. It always comes up in our 
um, annual planning meetings. How do we make sure that we ex we exist and we're relevant and re we're robust in another 50 years? But what you said it's easy for us. Well, what is easy for us is it's our business and we love it and we want to do it for 50 years. Why do you mean it's easy? It's easier for you because you've had some success behind it. I'm not saying it's easy. It's easy. I'm, I know you're getting up early and you're working hard. I'm just saying it's easier for you now than it would have been early on. Well, what is easy or easier for, for me is it's my business. I can have a long-term plan in the thing that's mine. Well, you know your business. Mm. You know your business. And, and one thing I would say to someone is if they're stuck in this system and they want this long-term thinking, and then start your own business. Surely, I mean, sh like surely the best time to build is when a town has been blown to bits and flattened and you can start again. And has that not just happened to our economy and businesses? The problem is that there's the, the customers got blown up too, so it's a little bit tough. <laughs> you always have a problem for my solutions. <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna be, you know, the economy is gonna take a wicked beating. Yeah, wicked beating. If you had, um, if you were gonna deploy a hundred thousand, this is a question. It's anonymous. If you were gonna, ah, oh, we've we've got a, a female question here as well, David. Um, two, if you're going to deploy a hundred thousand capital, where would you put it? Um, I wouldn't put it anywhere today because it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, so I'd sit on it today and probably, uh, when the market bottoms up, which it will do eventually, but not today, not tomorrow. When the market bottoms out, probably real estate. It's going to get repriced. Yeah. All your stuff is going to be worth a lot less money. Mm. So you have to buy more stuff. So that's good. Cool. If someone has 100000 now, yeah. sit on it. Sit on it. Do you think there's going to be some cheap businesses going? Yeah, but cheap businesses are cheap because they have a problem usually, and 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 whoever's buying it better have some expertise in that area, because you do yeah. need to have some expertise if you're going to be buying a business. Yeah, yeah, you've so got to be able to. All, business, all businesses have big problems, except small ones have less resources to deal with the problems. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So this is from Cheryl. Um, how important do you consider coaches, mentors, um, and sort of support for elite um, business owners? I think mentors are, are critical for everyone. Everyone needs to have someone who's been through the war. And maybe you may be dealing with a different war, but you need to have someone who's been through the war or been through a war to help you think clearly. Everyone needs a mentor. Critical. Mm. everyone needs one look hey. you kick ideas around you and i spent 15 minutes today before we did this kicking ideas around you kick ideas around i say what are you saying you say what are you saying we compare notes you know we find a common thread in what we're seeing yeah i'm just glad that this is virtual because it was my turn to buy you that lobster and cheeseburger <laughs> yeah. see you even got out paying for that i know next time next time it's going to be your turn again yeah, it is. Um, did you did you enjoy the burger and lobster we had at Burger and Lobster? I did. I did. How it does was... it compare, how does it compare to New York? Well, look, I, I eat almost no red meat, so um, I eat. I, that was probably the last time I had red meat. Oh. That was probably a year ago, right, or whatever it was, eight months ago. So I don't really eat red meat. I eat a little Irish lamb every so often. Um, and I grew up in New England, so we sort of invented the lobster roll. So, yeah. But all that being said, it was very, very, very good. Well, that's good. But and that, the beer yeah. was good. And if I remember right, we had French fries too. They were good. We had all the stuff that wasn't good for you. It was great. <laughs> and the price was fabulous. <laughs> yeah, it's free. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Great. So um, let's do a bit of a quick fire, David. Um, best advice you ever received and worst advice you ever received. Best advice I ever received was from my mother. No matter how bad it gets, you know, remember someone has it worse, so put one foot in front of the other. Always forward. Worst advice I ever got was from Morgan Stanley when I was going to sell a whole company. And they said, no, 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 we'll just sell a third of it. We sold the third of it for $1.65 billion. And then the dot-com boom bust happened. And the company went, went, went down to worthless. I could have sold the whole thing for $6 billion, $7 billion, $8 billion maybe. I sold a third of it for $1.65. They said, no, no, no. Don't sell it all. I said, are you sure? It's a good price. Shouldn't we sell it all? No, no, no. Taubman gave me that advice. Worst yeah. advice I ever got. I can remember exactly where I was standing when I got that advice too. East 63rd between 1st and 2nd. Mm. On the south side of the street, I remember exactly where I was, right outside a restaurant called Bravo Gianni's. Bad advice. Not bitter or anything. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> um, any regrets? Any sort of business regrets? Yeah, I wish I had been more efficient with my time so I could have accomplished more. I have a, lot, I have a long list of stuff I want to get done. Mm. What's, st what's still left on that list? Oh, shit. <laughs> The list is long. Look, I mean, the list is. Look, we got we got papers everywhere. The list is, the list is long. We got we got we got a, a another documentary. We got to get out the door. I want to redo my my kid show that I I had the number one kid show in America on TV. I want to redo that show. Want to get that foundation going in in rural Ireland. I want to get. Um, I got another book I'm working on. But I got I got a long list of. Stuff got to wire all of Ireland with for that national broadband plan. Got a lot of stuff on my list. Surely that's good, though, isn't it? Is it not good to have some incompleted things to get your teeth? Of, of course. No other way. Yeah. No other way. <laughs> that one, that book by Ian Robinson, by the way. One of the things in that book says, if you don't have focused goals, uh, your brain actually. Uh, from a chemical standpoint, your brain doesn't function as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a couple more then. Um, if there was one person you think I should interview that you would love to watch, who would that be? I, say, I assume since you're going to really interview them, they have to be alive, right? Yeah, we're, we're taking a live one. <laughs> yeah, you want a live one. Look, I, I think um, it would be one of these pe men or women that are running one of these huge, huge retail organizations that are shut down now. And it'd be great to interview them now and then a year, 18 months from now. You know, take someone who's running, you know, 1,200 coffee shops or running, you know, 50 stores or just someone who's running a, a big, a big retail organization that their world just imploded. And how are they going to, you know, how are they going to rethink, how are they going to rethink that business? Mm. How are they going to, you know, and then 18 months from now, they may be, they may be bringing you tea or they may have figured it out, but it'd be very interesting. Some, one of those big, big mall owners or big retail or someone who owns, you know, massive amount, you know, uh, Ian Livingston owns what, 6,000 hotel rooms or something in the UK, something like that. Someone that, that owns the, a big business that's been totally transformed or the head of British Air. I'd like to see, hear what his plan is. The head of British Air. I'd like okay. to see what, yeah. yeah, what's his plan? Yeah. All right. Well, um, my um, my guy who helps me with all of our finding our guests, he'll be listening to this. So we'll we'll go and check some of them out. This podcast, this interview, my the theme I have for my content um, has the word disruptive in it. Disruptive entrepreneur. Um, what does that word mean to you? It means throw away the status quo, throw away everything you knew have a more entrepreneurial approach, more revolutionary approach, throw away everything you knew and start over. That's what it means to me. Good time for that. <laughs>
for sure. Can I ask uh, one or two more questions? Can I go back to my job? Yeah, we're done. If you, yeah, sure. I, I just said, tell me when you're ready. No, no. So. But if, if 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 someone had if someone had one more you want to ask, that's fine. I, at some point, I got to go back and make a living. <laughs> Yeah. All right. I, I know. I know when my time is up, David. I know. I got to um, prove. I got to prove to you that I still like money. So I got to go back yeah. and make some. <laughs> uh, where can we follow you? I know you're on Instagram. Where 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 should we follow you? Either yeah, I think it's at DC McCourt on Instagram or LinkedIn. Those are the only. I, I'm on Twitter too, but I I think Instagram, LinkedIn, are probably the two that are probably more relevant for me. Twitter would be the next one. Yeah. I don't. Um, I've never been on my Facebook account, so I don't really. I know you use that, but I don't really. Maybe I should. I, I just don't. I mean, you can only you can only follow so much. Or they can go to my website, www.davidmccourt.com. Mm -hmm. They can go to my website at davidmccourt.com, or they can go to Instagram or LinkedIn and buy my book and hit me up and tell me what they think. Yeah, and I would just like to say I know um, some of my community did message you because a lot of people don't because they don't want to encroach. They're worried. They don't think people would reply. I know you do reply. Um, and I think that's a nice thing because um, a lot of people don't. Um, and your book, uh, Total Rethink, that's on Amazon, Audible, etc. We can get that anywhere we like. Anywhere you like. And then give us a hint about your new book or is it too early? Too early. We'll be, we'll be talking again. Yeah. For All right. Sure. I really enjoy it. Uh, uh, save some money, skip your therapist, jumpstart that Lamborghini of yours, <laughs> take it out for a test drive, hang out the window like a dog, getting some fresh air, enjoy the good weather. You've had fabulous weather. Yeah. Go for a ride, go down the beach or something with that Lamborghini of yours. Yeah. And other than that, good, hey, good luck in rethinking your business. Thank you. It's been fun. And who needs a therapist when I've got you to tell me what to do? It's all good. Exactly. <laughs> you need a therapist that gives you good advice. You, yeah. need, you need good advice. <laughs> hey, listen, thanks. Was it was this helpful for your listeners? Yeah, I'm sure they loved it. I've had, um, I, I mean, I can't see the comments, but I've got my um, Felicity, who's doing all the tech. She's pinged load through. So um, uh, I'm sure they've loved it. And look, congratulations on rethinking your business. It's going to be huge. Thank you. Know. you. Thanks, David. Thank you. God bless. Take care.